And there was a large group of people as we went to fund the bonds to build this building that said it can never be done. So every, everything that the engineers and the architects did as it says, was new. You know, they didn't have any model to, to follow. There was no place to go look and see how somebody else did it. People said, no, you can't play baseball inside. You can't play sports inside. And they said, yeah, we can. It was mind boggling just to look up, up there and says, finally, this is the place to play. This is the Astrodome. This is the eighth one of the world. It's the home run. Goosebumps, just walk in there and look at it. Everything in it was perfect. He's gone, he is gone all the way. It was truly a wonder of the world at that time and, and uh, we didn't realize, I guess, uh, how fortunate we were to have access to it. He got it, no drive, no hitter, number five. And I remember it very well. Everyone was amazed at the growth and the success of the Astrodome. It was all-purpose entertainment, family-friendly. Oh, you just about named it. I think we just about had it here. You had the Ollie fights here. You had the, uh, the basketball championships. They, anything that they could bring in here to promote this building, they were going to do. And pandemonium at the Astrodome. This place brought more women into the game. They dressed to the nines. They dressed up as they would be going out of the church to a cocktail party. To a wedding. We had the first scoreboard that, that, that was animated. We had the first the sky boxes. We had the first artificial turf. After this, dome stadiums were built all over the place. This was the pioneer. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey gang, what's new? How you doing? My name's Tim Hanlon and I appreciate uh, to no end uh, you finding our little show here in the wild and wacky world of podcasts. Uh, as you know by now, uh, if you've been paying attention, at least to the intro, it's called Good Seats Still Available and it's our curious little journey uh, into what used to be in professional sports. So we're going to take a little bit of a, a detour, as you can hear in our little intro, into not uh, necessarily the teams, the leagues, the people involved, but I actually want to get into... And this is a great example, I think, to start Uh, the actual buildings and the actual arenas in which uh, some of these uh, stories that we unearth each week for you actually took place. Uh, Some of those uh, structures are still with us, like in the case of the Astronome, which is the topic of our conversation uh, this week uh, with our guest Bob Trump were in just a few minutes. Some of them are not standing anymore and are are forever linked to the history of the, uh, the teams and the leagues that played in them. Uh, despite them not being there anymore. I think we're going to do quite a bit of uh, investigation into more of these. Uh, And uh, I think you'll enjoy this one as we get sort of this little tributary uh, of exploration underway. Uh, Bob Trumper is our guest in the uh, book that he co-authored with his his colleague, Ken Womack, is called The Eighth Wonder of the World, uh, The Life of Houston's Iconic Astrodome. It is published by our friends at uh, the University of Nebraska Press, and it is being reissued in paperback form. Uh, I got a copy of it in my hot little hands, and uh, it will be dropping the book. Uh, I believe it's on November 1st or so, which is around the time that this episode will be uh, hitting podcast land. So you have no excuse but not to uh, go find that book. And uh, of course, we'll have links for it on our website at goodseatstillavailable.com. And uh, we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but, uh, you know, you. Uh, You know, neither of us, neither Bob nor I uh, were um, uh, natives of Houston nor Texas, for that matter. Uh, But uh, there's no question that anybody in the American sports scene uh, professionally or as fans or or folks in between, for that matter, uh, frankly, globally, that are that that uh, at the time and certainly uh, in uh, in today's modern uh, discussion, uh, were not and or are not aware of the. uh, just the sheer magnitude of the Astrodome. It's 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 being willed into uh, reality. Uh, we'll get into some of that and uh, the teams that uh, inhabited it. And um, uh, frankly, just uh, it's just an amazing story on so many different levels on uh, economics, uh, uh, construction, uh, creature comforts for uh, for fans. Um, you know how uh, 
uh, local governments uh, pursue and or partner uh, with the public to uh, to uh, create these buildings and 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 the uh, civic pride and uh, uh, supposedly economics that come along with it. Uh, all of these things and more are encompassed in this amazing story of this amazing structure known as the Houston Astrodome. And of course, you know, we uh, focus on the various teams and leagues no longer with us. Uh, and sure enough, the Astrodome had a ton of them, uh, uh, no doubt. The uh, Houston Cult 45s, Obviously, we're known as the Houston Astros when they moved into the Astrodome, but the Colt 45s, as we'll talk about with Bob in a few minutes, uh, were frankly, by all uh, accounts, the the major reason why this building was built in the first place. Uh, so do not to understand a little bit about the Colt 45s history, how Houston got an expansion franchise uh, announced in 1960. Uh, a little bit we delved into when we got into uh, our conversation with Russ Butheit on uh, the Continental League, and we'll talk about the intrigue there. Uh, but uh, literally that uh, Major League Baseball franchise granting uh, to Houston of a uh, of a new team uh, certainly set in motion. Uh, this building would not exist had it not been for that. Uh, but as you also hear, too, lots of other stuff like the Houston Stars of the old United Soccer Association and then North American Soccer League in uh, 1967 and 68. We'll get into that. Uh, and the Stars name, which has a very interesting uh, a little side journey that I learned something about. You will as well. Of course, football, huge uh, in the uh, past of this building. Uh, the Houston Oilers, for sure, the AFL and NFL versions. Uh, the Houston Rockets played a few games uh, here and there uh, before their building was created. The Houston Texans, uh, they're maybe half of a year in the WFL. Uh, and, of course, the Houston Gamblers of the USFL, our previous episodes on that Um uh, for example, with Jeff Perlman a couple episodes ago, we talked about the gamblers a little bit uh, in 84 and 85. And of course, not to be forgotten, the Houston Hurricane, the three-year second go-round in the NASL for soccer uh, in Houston, were also players there. And we also talk about some of the other stuff, too, other uh, iconic sports events. I mean, you Evil Knievel had a bunch of events there. You had uh, the Battle of the Sexes between Bobby Riggs uh, and Billy Jean King in that sort of nationally televised uh, spectacle uh, in the early 70s, that happened in the Dome. And of course, as we talked about in a previous episode uh, with our pal Howard Zuckerman, the TVS television network producer, uh, the 1968 uh, uh, basketball game between, between the uh, UCLA Bruins and the uh, Houston Cougars, uh, the game of the century that uh, being narrated by uh, Dick Enberg and friends uh, was also played there. So we're going to get into whole bunches of uh, of memories around that. And, and frankly, the whole rationale behind the uh, conception uh, the building and then the running uh, of the Houston Astrodome again with our guest Bob Trump War and uh, our discussion, the eighth wonder of the world, the life of Houston's iconic Astrodome. And uh, stay tuned for that in a couple of seconds. You will enjoy this immensely. Uh, and I think, frankly, you're going to enjoy immensely some of the wares this week in particular from some of our great sponsors, because we've got a lot of direct tie ins with uh, this week's topic, which always makes for uh, for fun uh, and, uh, and and logic. Uh, and uh, our first uh, uh, friends are going to be at uh, 503 Sports. That's 503-sports.com. And uh, they call themselves the king of throwbacks. And uh, you'll see why when you check them out at 503-sports.com or 503-sports.com. It's your choice, really. It's all the same. Uh, and, uh, of course, when you're there, you're going to not only see great uh, T-shirts with logos and stuff, uh, and you'll find a few Houston items there for sure. Uh, but they've also uh, really found a nice niche for themselves in creating and recreating uh, throwback uniforms, actual uniforms handcrafted uh, for various teams and leagues no longer with us. And you will find there, uh, much to uh, my amazement, uh, two of uh, the teams uh, that uh, we uh, talk about a little bit here on this little episode, uh, the Houston Texans of the World Football League. Yes, there's a replica jersey that's uh lovingly crafted by 503 Sports there, as well as the Houston Gamblers. So not only if you want a T-shirt uh, rem remembering those teams from the Houston Astrodome, uh, you can also find those replica uh, reconstructed jerseys of both of those teams at 503 Sports. That's 503-sports.com. And of course, you want to make sure you use the promo code SEATS and you will get 10% uh, off of all of your purchases there. It's 503 Sports. That's 503 hyphen or 503 sports.com. And we thank them for their support of our show, as do we thank our friends at oldschoolshirts.com. Oldschoolshirts.com is uh, the place to find uh, high quality uh, t shirt garb 
uh, with all kinds of memories about teams and leagues and logos. And it's not just in sports. It's also things like uh, uh, old legendary radio stations and shopping malls and uh, amusement parks and and perhaps uh, dining establishments that uh, you may have remembered uh, from your past uh, that uh, either are uh, no longer with us or uh, have moved on to bigger and better things, but uh, were more humble, I guess, in their in their origins back in the day. And and that's what OldSchoolShirts.com is all about, uh, is remembering those things. And you will find there a whole bunch of things around some of the teams that we talk about again here on this episode around Houston. Uh, you're going to find shirts uh, for the Houston Gamblers. You're going to see uh, Houston Hurricane stuff. There's Houston Texans, WFL stuff. Uh, there is uh, Houston Stars, uh, NASL and USA stuff. And you will also find a, a shirt, I think, or maybe two, uh, that literally is uh, devoted to the actual Astrodome itself. It's a really cool shirt there that I'm looking at right now. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's got the logo, and it's the great way to show your interest in and or passion for uh, and remembrances of the Houston Astrodome back in the day. OldSchoolShirts.com. That's the place to check them all out. And uh, when you're there, you can use the promo code GOODSEATS uh, and you will get 10% off all of your purchases there uh, as well. It's OldSchoolShirts.com. Again, promo code GOODSEATS and it's 10% off all of your purchases there. And we thank P.F. Wilson and uh, his friends uh, in Cincinnati at OldSchoolShirts.com for their patronage of our show too. All right. And last but not least, we want to remember our friend, not remember, we want to say hello and thank you to our friend Dean Mitchell at SportsHistoryCollectibles.com. Forget shirts and, and garb. How about souvenirs? How about uh, uh, memorabilia? How about pennants and buttons and and uh, press guides and and media guides and and programs and yearbooks and all that kind of stuff? Stickers, bumper stickers, pennants. That kind of stuff is all there for you. And you're going to find a ton, a whole host of Houston sports team stuff there uh, at SportsHistoryCollectibles.com. And there, when you use the promo code Good Seats. Not only are you going to get uh, satisfaction, but you're going to get 15% off all of your purchases there at sportshistorycollectibles.com. And you can find all kinds of Houston stuff there uh, and, and and far beyond just Houston as well. Uh, and we thank them for their support of our show, too. All right. So we have uh, uh, there. There is no excuse not to try any of those uh, great sponsors. And we appreciate you. Uh, you're doing so. Uh, but uh, after you've gone there, after you've uh, uh, unpaused this little uh, this little uh, wrap here, uh, stay tuned. Coming up, here's our conversation uh, about the Houston Astrodome with Bob Trumpor right here on the show. A lot of this show over the last year and a half or so, we, for whatever reasons, we've been focused on uh, teams and leagues. Uh, no longer yeah. with us, dearly departed, et cetera. And it, there's a lot of sort of, uh, you know, ephemera around those things, including, and this will be our first conversation around this idea, you know, buildings and, and locations and things that were sort of, or are still part of uh, all of those stories, right? And, um, sure. you know, I, I can't think of a, of a better uh, structure, I guess, than uh, to kind of sort of uh, pursue that sort of first uh, conversation around than this uh, uh, amazing uh, uh, a building, right, that uh, ushered in so many different sort of uh, novelties called the Astrodome. So before we get to sort of the specifics of it, give us a little bit of background about your uh, professional career and how you stumbled across this uh, idea uh, about the Astrodome to kind of uh, focus some time and effort on it. Sure. I, uh, I grew up in the New York metropolitan area, so I'm not native to, to Texas or Houston. But when I, was a, when I was a youngster, my dad used to take me to the old Yankee Stadium before they did any of the renovations. And, um, and he used to take me to Shea Stadium, which was relatively new back then. And you had, so I, I got the contrast of the old versus the new. And the, sta- the whole stadium issue, because, you know, I, I, I was in ballparks quite a bit as a kid. I, I, you know, I, it was something that I, I just you know, I was somewhat fascinated about. So, so when I was doing my scholarship, I started to look at, um, different ballparks. I know even before that, I just remember when, when, uh, and this was in 79, right after I had graduated from uh, college, I remember I, I drove cross country with a friend of mine, uh, and we had gone from, you know, to all these different ballparks kind of before the the nationwide ballpark tour thing 
was a fad. And I remember, you know, just going from one city to the next and just getting to a ball game and just noticing the differences in the ballparks. And also being somewhat fascinated by the politics that was involved in getting them built. And, you know, I, when, I, when I got to Penn State, you know, and I work at, at the Altoona campus at Penn State Altoona, the, uh, the academic dean was a guy named Ken Womack. His, his grandfather had, um, was the structural engineer of the Astrodome. And, you know, I had done, you know, I had done significant research. And in fact, my first book was on, on ballparks in general, the politics behind getting the built, the history of that. And, you know, I, I went all the way back to the 19th century to present day. And, you know, Ken and I talked quite a bit about the Astrodome. And while we were t- while he was talking to me about the Astrodome, I was sort of looking at transformative moments in ballpark construction and how th- how the dynamic changed. So, as an example, uh, Forbes Field you might not think of Forbes Field in Pittsburgh as is revolutionary, but it was the first one million dollar ballpark, and it contained three times more structural steel than any ballpark up to that point. So, you know, and it was also sort of catered to, you know, a a luxury clientele. Um, You know, you wouldn't know it now, but back back in in the day, in 1909, Oakland and Pittsburgh, the Oakland section of of Pittsburgh, was one of the more upscale audience, uh, you know, neighborhoods. So, you know, that kind of changed things to some degree. and then you had other ballparks sort of culminating with Yankee Stadium being sort of the last of the big ballparks before World War II being built. Um, and, you know, actually, you don't, you don't think about it, but the Yankees were the last team to play in a wooden ballpark, you know, before they moved into Yankee Stadium. So they played in kind of, you know, a, a more dumpy atmosphere before they moved into Yankee Stadium, which was then probably the premier ballpark anywhere in the country. So, you know, then, I, you know, we thought about post-World War II and, you know, how things changed. And honestly, you know, you had Dodger Stadium, which which was somewhat of a game changer. But prior to that, and most people don't think of this, but County Stadium in Milwaukee was, was, was a ballpark that changed a lot of things in that the city of Milwaukee built their ballpark with the express purpose of tr- of trying to lure a major league franchise to their city, and it was taxpayer subsidized, you probably know where this is going. <laughs> you know, so now taxpayer subsidy was kind of you know the thing that owners would say, "Well, what are you going to do for me?" You know, and and owners realized that they had cultural capital wrapped up in in these teams, and that they could sort of leverage that cultural capital to get. You know subsidies. Um, fast forward to the Astrodome, Houston. You know a guy named George Kirksey, who was a PR guy, who prior to being a PR guy was a sports fanatic who wrote, um, you know, who wrote for one of the major wire services and covered everything from World Series to uh, you know Rose Bowls to every major event of the time he had covered. And, you know, he, he was very well known, you know, in, in journalism circles. And then when he moved back to Houston, his dominant desire was to get a major league team in Houston. So he sort of, you know, pushed for that heavily. And that all sort of moved in the direction where, uh, you know, the Astrodome got built. Quite frankly, if you know Houston, you know the summers can be oppressively hot. The mosquitoes, you know, are are incredibly large. In fact, Sandy Koufax referred to uh, some of the mosquitoes, you know, when they played, when the Dodgers came into the city to play against the Colt 45s, he, he referred to some of the mosquitoes as twin engine jobs. They were so big. Uh, so it was obvious that Houston had to do something because the outdoors just wasn't going to cut it in a a city as as, as hot during the summer months as Houston. And Hoffheinz came up with the idea to, you know, Roy Hoffheinz came up with the idea to build the Astrodome. Uh, I wanted to examine it simply because it was a transformative structure that really made luxury, 
sort of the focal point and made visiting the venue more important than watching the team. Um, you know, if you think about it, the Colt 45s and those early Astros were not were not very good teams. You know, even though they had some some stars on them who you know later um, did extraordinarily well. Uh, they had losing records consistently, but the, the venue became the thing that people, you know, talked about and wanted to visit. And there was unbridled luxury that was in no other stadium. So I wanted to really explore that. And and for my colleague and co-author Ken Walmack, you know, for him it was a passion because his grandfather had done the engineering on it, and he grew up, you know, just talking about the Astrodome, going to the Astrodome, and sort of enjoying the the whole, you know, experience of the Astrodome. You know, for me, I had only been to it once, you know, and that was during, you know, the, the you know, those cross-country tours, you know, trips that I had made. Uh, but Ken had been to it multiple times. So when we talked about it, you know, and, you know, we discussed doing a book. I was all in because I was fascinated about stadiums and I wanted to know more about how the Astrodome got built and all the politics of it and, you know, how the city reacted to it and how the nation reacted to it. So for me, it was, it it was something that was part of my larger, um, you know, scholarship, you know, for Ken, it was something that, you know, was near and dear to his heart. And, And the result was, you know, we, we both benefited, I think, from each other's expertise and passions, and and that's kind of how the book came together. Yeah, and obviously, and the structure is obviously a, a marvel, especially when you look at it on a, there's a whole bunch of different sort of frames by which you can look at uh, this uh, this construct as being a, a game changer on a, a you know uh, sports and and and. Uh, community dynamics, but so let's let's back up a little bit in terms of of this story. So you mentioned a couple of names and and some things here, but my suspicion is now this is only informed by uh, my learnings uh, in our little cursory journey on this uh, silly little show uh, with the uh, Continental Baseball League, the Continental League uh, that was. Uh, this idea that was, uh, in essence, uh, for a number of different reasons, pushing uh, baseball into uh, uh, further expansion, expansionary uh, concepts and ideas. And I, I suspect that some of this uh, origination for this uh, this amazing dome structure uh, was rooted in that, in Houston's desire uh, to get a uh, professional baseball franchise uh, for whatever reasons not already uh, granted. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The Continental League was, in essence, a way to leverage cities to get professional baseball into their communities. Um, and George Kirksey became, you know, Branch Rickey's, you know, the secretary of operations for the Continental League. So he tried to, you know, sort of weave his way in as a powerful force so that when baseball, you know, when Major League Baseball started negotiating about whether the Continental League would be a major league or whether they would dissolve the thing and only accept a couple cities, that Houston was, you know, at the front of the table. Um, now, honestly, New York, you know, was always going to be at the front of the table because it was such a large city and it was such a, you know, such a media mecca. And, you know, New York's largesse a lot of times, you know, in and of itself gets itself on the map. But Houston was a growing city and, you know, had a lot going for it, but it did, it didn't have any professional, you know, major professional sports until until the Oilers and the, uh, you know, and and the Colt Forty Fives came to town. What, what, would you would it be too simple to say though that the idea and then the ultimate uh, construction and, and opening of the Astrodome was because of Houston's desire to get a baseball team? You know what? The baseball team was probably the major driver. Um, what's what's interesting is I don't think Roy Hoffheintz, the the guy, the brainchild behind the Astrodome, necessarily was you know cared as much about baseball. In fact, he really didn't care as much about baseball as as George Kirksey did, as Tal Smith did, as, you know, a lot of the folks, you know, maybe even Bob Smith for that matter, you know, the money, you know, one of the big money men behind the, the uh, you know, the, the Houston sports franchise. But uh, 
getting baseball was essential to it was kind of the predicate to make the case for building the ballpark because the city essentially the Astrodome was such a large project that there was no way it was going to get paid for only by revenue streams it was it was just too big a project it needed a taxpayer um it needed taxpayers to get it built initially um and back then the the expectation was you know and it, it's not an expectation that happens today was that the revenues from the astrodome would pay for uh you know, essentially pay for the, the the funding that the taxpayers kicked up. It never really did, but I think you know there was sort of a sense that you know it wouldn't be it wouldn't be an you know a financial anchor that you know sort of drained off of off of Harris County's coffers. So you know, baseball was sort of the the primary reason to sell the community. And, you know, you think about it, the NFL may now be bigger than Major League Baseball, but uh, back then, baseball, honestly, was the national pastime. And, you know, if you compare the ratings on television, uh, you know, baseball, in many ways, probably did better in, in many instances. The Super Bowl hadn't even started yet. Uh, the NFL was was kind of... It was established and it was credible, but it, it, I mean, it was only a few years removed from being on sort of a, a small fledgling network called the Dumont Network, and you know, it finally made its way onto CBS. So it wasn't really the big force that it it is now. So baseball was was I think essential for it to get built. Roy Hoffheinz, though, had, had, you know, he wanted something that was a larger entertainment complex for the entire county. And he, I think his big dream was for all of Texas and that the nation would come to visit it quite a bit as well. Yeah, so it sounds like it was almost just, just as much, if not uh, even more so, a uh Houston slash Texas uh, civic pride thing. And, of course, in Texas, they don't do anything small, right? <laughs> No, and I think that that was the driver. I mean, Roy Hoffheinz was a guy who dreamed big, and you know, it's amazing. But he was he was the youngest guy ever to you know be elected to the Texas state legislature. You know, he was a judge at a very young age. Uh, you know, he was sort of the he was sort of the whiz kid who always you know dreamed big and, and overachieved and, and worked harder than anyone else. And I think, he, he, you know, he, he initially grew up in Beaumont, Texas, uh, you know, but when he was very young, his, his, his parents moved to Houston. And so he considered Houston his hometown. And he wanted to make Houston sort of a national, you know, something that was on the map nationally and that was recognized by everyone. Well, so, so let's get into it a bit about Hoffheights, because obviously it seems to me like if there's any sort of uh, uh, defining personality into, uh, shall we say, willing this uh, project and stadium and uh, what ultimately became known as the eighth modern wonder of the world, uh, whether it's real or, uh, a, a, you know, a boast, uh, is is him. And so he he started a sort of as a, so he had a mayoral uh, a background and, and uh, other sort of county governments uh, kind of stuff. But he was also, I guess, kind of a, an entrepreneur and or sort of business connector, no? Yeah, he was. I mean, he was very much a businessman. He he always had he always had deals going, and it was amazing how for him he didn't mind juggling five or six things at once. You know, and, and they they were quite often things that were big enough that you know the average person would ju- would struggle to keep up with just one or two of those items. But he, but he would. You know, he he didn't mind. You know, he didn't mind taking charge, but he also didn't mind delegating when he you know realized that you know he'd be getting into the weeds with minutia. So he was always able to get a, a heck of a lot more done uh, than most people. And he was so high energy, and he honestly was so, so hands on that you know it was hard to run something by him. I mean, he would he actually, you know, was at the Astrodome constantly as it was being constructed and came up with all kinds of ideas and probably drove the builders crazy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, uh, insisted on things that made the Astrodome absolutely unique. So let me just give you one example of that. Uh, 
no one else had made these luxurious skyboxes prior to the Astrodome. I mean, there were cases, as an example, Albert Spaulding at the ballpark that, you know, for his, his major league team in Chicago, you know, had sort of something above, you know, above uh, home plate, you know, where he could, you know, it was, it was you know, sort of, you know, sort of like a skybox, and it had a uh, telephone in it and that sort of thing. And it was kind of a luxury thing, but it was, you know, sort of a, uh, you know, one-shot deal. Uh, you know, and there were other ballparks that might have had, t- you know, touches of luxury. But the luxury skybox was something that I think Roy Hoffheinz really could see becoming something big. And the builders essentially just wanted to put wiring and ductwork where the skyboxes were. And Hoffheinz said, no, 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 we're going to, we're going to build these skyboxes and they're going to be big. And, you know, the builders figured out ways to, you know, route the ductwork to make things work, but they built the skyboxes into them. And one of them was actually a, uh, you know, was Hoffheinz's suite where he actually, you know, stayed, lived there for many, many, many uh, days. So which came first then? Uh, it w- was it the pursuit of the baseball team, which ultimately became the Colt 45s and uh, a legitimate or disingenuous pursuit in the Continental League to do so or this building idea from what you, you know what? Uh, Kirksey was uh, Kirksey had come into uh, Houston in the 50s. And he was pushing for a baseball team throughout the 50s. Uh, but he really didn't have, he, he, you know, as, as a former sports writer and a PR guy, he didn't have the heavy pockets, you know, the deep pockets of, of the Texas oil men and the folks who could really make things happen. So, you know, the baseball team thing, I think, came first. But it wasn't nearly as serious as it could have been if the money, you know, if the if the money was involved. And you know, honestly, it all kind of came together in a very strange, serendipitous way. Uh, the one thing that Kirksey ended up ended up getting together with some bankers and a guy named Craig Cullinan. And Cullinan was heir to the Texaco fortune. So he had a lot of oil money and, and was, a, was, you know, his, you know, his dad was a big mover and shaker who had done so much for Houston, you know, getting the ship channel, uh, you know, done in a way that made Houston a major part of, you know, commerce and that sort of thing. And was an advisor to presidents, and, and you know was was a pretty impressive guy in and of himself. So what you had was, uh, you know, all of a sudden you had you know some power coming to the movement. But then the other thing that happened that was that was really the big serendipitous move was Roy Hoffheinz was trying to get a shopping, was trying to get used to, in, in, in to, to an indoor shopping mall. I mean, shopping malls aren't as big as they used to be now, but back then, you know, they were really in their infancy. And Hoffheinz thought that, you know, having a shopping mall would be a, would be a great thing to have for Houston. So that was one of his business ventures. And he was pushing and pushing very hard to get the shopping mall in Houston. And he, he thought only one large shopping mall could succeed in Houston. And, and um, the, the, um, another guy edged him out in the bidding. What the, what the guy did was essentially subsidized the anchors, um, you know, and, and the anchor department stores by, you know, sort of giving them, you know, giving them a piece of the pie to build what was called Sharp Town. Um, and, you know, it was the first major indoor shopping mall in Houston. And it wasn't as elaborate as what Hoffheinz would have done. Hoffheinz was already in discussions with a guy named Buckminster Fuller, who, as you probably know, sure. you know, pioneered the geodesic dome. So he was already thinking about domes and he was thinking about doing things that were sort of splashy for this shopping mall. And when you know, and essentially when, uh, you know, when Sharp had sort of out, outbid and out, outmaneuvered Hoffheinz on the mall, essentially what happened is Hoffheinz still had a lot of things going on, 
but that was a big void because he was doing a lot of a lot of his energy was going to that, and he needed you know, and he decided I need something else, and he crossed paths with Hoffine, with uh, Kirksey and some of the banking folks, as well as Bob Smith, another oil man who you know, and a real estate uh, guru as well. And they, it, it all sort of came together with the plans for the Astrodome. But the, okay, so, uh, and maybe from a timeline perspective, right? So this, basically, the, the awarding of the, of the Houston baseball franchise for the National League to be known as the Houston Cult 45s, that really was the starting gun, no pun, I guess. Uh, yeah, to, no, it really was. You're okay. right. <laughs> and, and, and so, okay, so in essence, that is that that's the timeline then, is that the awarding of that franchise and whatever the shenanigans and the, the reality or the unreality of the Continental League is a lever to essentially affect that into being. Um, how does this uh, then, that seems like it's the starting gun to get uh, this project underway. Maybe you can kind of give us a little bit of a uh, an understanding of sort of okay now we've we've achieved our goal in in getting awarded a major league baseball franchise how do we get this arguably next generation and never been done before construct that we've promised major league baseball done <laughs> i think that was that came out of you know the half you know half was he was an amazing salesperson. I mean, he could sell you things you didn't need. <laughs> so he he basically, you know, and he was mayor of Houston for for you know a while as well. And you know, Hoffman's experience as mayor was sort of a strange one in that, you know, I think some of the some of Houston's elites were okay with him being mayor. Uh, and didn't block him, thinking, you know, he's one of us, you know, he, he's one of the uh, powerful elites. But Hoffman's had a soft spot for for the downtrodden and the folks who who might not have, you know, the deep pockets, and worked hard to build, you know, good, good roads and, you know, and infrastructure for the folks in the poorer sections of the city. So the minority community kind of liked him as well, and he, he built a reasonably broad coalition of folks who who were willing to support him and, and remembered him as someone who was friendly to their needs at the same time as in some ways he might have alienated some of the powerful when he was mayor but they wanted they wanted to be major league as well so they weren't going to they weren't going to block him for the most part although a few a few tried to um so this was something that you know was kind of had grassroots as well as uh, you know the deep pockets wanting it to happen, and the result was that politically uh, it was going to happen because you know they had they had the votes for the referendum and they had the votes to make it happen for this for the county to fund it, and Hoffman's pretty much put on a really big sell about how this would put Houston on the map. It would change, you know, it would change Houston forever. They would no longer be considered a minor league backwater city. And I, I mean, if you go back to that point in time, you know, you're talking the late 50s, um, early 60s, you know, Houston was considered sort of a backwater cattle type, oil type town that wasn't particularly sophisticated. And you had overlaying that, um, you know, the the space program becoming a national phenomenon, and and Hotlines was actually very friendly with with uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, so that didn't hurt either. Uh, and in fact, Hotlines was such good friends with uh, was such good friends with uh, Johnson that you know on the day of the Kennedy assassination, he was on the phone a few times with. Johnson. Uh, I mean, if you can imagine the chaos of that day, I don't think Johnson talked to very many people, but he was close enough to Roy Hoffheitz that he considered him a very dear friend. So you had so many things lining up for this to happen that you knew it was going to happen, but at the same time, the amount of money to get it done was, you know, was a pretty tall order for back then. Well, so the Colt 45s, I mean, they're, they're, they began playing in 62, but the the dome was still uh, not even, you know, broke. Uh, the ground hadn't even been broken yet for it, right? So what was the process and the plan? And, and frankly, I'm okay. I, I ignorant as to where the Colt 45s actually played. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, basically what they did was 
they could have played in a minor league ballpark and expanded it, but Hoffman's being the you know being the type of guy he was with the bluster, the bravado, always wanting something you know bigger and better. Wanted to build his own, wanted to build his own temporary ballpark, and that's what they ended up doing. You know, building a temporary ballpark that he tried to put some flourishes on that made it look unique. But he wanted it to be within within eye shot of the Astrodome, so people would every time they came to the ball game be able to see the Astrodome being built. So. You know that took place. You know, and they had to rush to get that darn thing built, and and they really did. But one of the things he did, and it, it probably wouldn't shock you when you think about the Astrodome with all the colored seats and everything, they used a lot of splashy colors that made it look. It, one rep, one reporter when they opened this this new place, uh, you know, compared it to uh, you know sort of a major league Disney World because it, it was so flashy with the colors and it had, you know, they had. They had sort of had a club for the kids, which is was back then. I think you know a bit revolutionary. I mean, you had the knot hole gangs and things like that, but this was sort of a little more organized. And they also had sort of a uh, you know a, a sort of cowboy themed, you know, western themed, uh, you know, club in there that you could go in and eat and stuff. So that was sort of a precursor to the you know sort of private club type things. And, you know, you think about that period, that was sort of a strange period in American history where television was just starting to take, you know, take hold and, and was really taking off big time. And one of the things that the, the film, you know, one of the things that, you know, the film industry did to sort of compete against the small screen was put these major epics up, you know, which required a large screen to look magnificent. So you had Westerns very popular back then, you know, and some of the, you know, some of the other things like that, the larger than life stuff, but television, you know, being what it is, they said, Oh, Westerns are popular. Well, we're going to put up Westerns. So the gun smoke, I think was the number one show of the time. So that Western theme kind of worked, you know, but I, I hate to say it, you know, Roy Hoffman's really never liked that that theme that echoed to the past. He always was trying to be forward thinking, and he was much more he was much more captivated by the space program and Houston's potential to be looked at as a technology center, and tried to leverage the you know the sort of emergence of the space program as well as the you know the uh, you know the Astrodome itself as sort of being, you know, markers, sort of mileposts for Houston to showcase the fact that they embrace technology, they're a thoroughly modern city. Uh, And that's probably why the the team name actually changed pretty quickly. But there's a lot more to the name change. (laughs) We could talk about that too, but, you know, that's up to you if you want to go into that. Yeah, why not? That could be a good segue as to actually then them getting into the building. But I I guess before we sort of, before you you, uh, answer that, uh, it it does seem to me that, you know, obviously this uh, this, uh, Colt Stadium, right, which is uh, essentially a designed to be sort of temporary. And, and it's interesting to me because obviously, so I think it's kind of brilliant, right? You've got this sort of stadium within eye, eyesight or eye shot of the actual construction of what the future looks like, right? So it gives it gives the entire you know community an idea of like, we're, this is a, this is a, a movement f- towards the towards a future, not so d- don't pay attention too much to the big mosquitoes and, and the humidity and stuff. But it was interesting, based on what I can tell, the first few years, I mean, it was three years that they played in Colt Stadium. The last two of them, the 63 and 64, they were dead last in attendance in the National League. So yeah, they, where was that enthusiasm? And, and that, that kind of had to maybe have a little bit of an effect on, okay, maybe what are we getting into here? And are we building sort of a, a white elephant maybe? I, You know, I think there was – I think – you might be right. There was probably some fear that this might be a permanent thing, but it seemed as though the folks, you know, in the trenches, you know, between Kirksey, between you know, some of the you know hierarchy of the uh, Colt Forty Fives, as well as the community leaders, really felt as though once the Astrodome was there, things would change because uh, the the. You know, going to a ball game in the middle of the, the, you know, in the dead center of the summer when it was, you know, in the high 90s and oppressively humid was something that you could kind of understand why, you know, some people would say, 
I'm not going to go to every game. So maybe I'm not getting season tickets, but I might go to one every other week. And that, that had to hurt attendance. So I think that was part of it. But I think there was an optimism about once the Astrodome was there, people would love to sit in air-conditioned comfort in a, you know, in a padded theater-style seat and just enjoy the game. All right, we're going to take a quick little pause here. we got to pay some bills. And uh, look, uh, nobody, you know, likes living in the past. Uh, we do revel in it, certainly, when this little show. Uh, and look, we certainly enjoy going back and remembering teams and leagues that don't exist anymore because they're just tremendous stories and, and history there. And we don't want to forget those. But, you know, we can't always live uh, in those times. We can't uh, sort of just roll around in nostalgia all day. We wouldn't get anything done in our lives now, would we? Uh, and in the realm of sports, come on, look, you know, uh, there's uh, so much going on. There's a, just a plethora of, of games and uh, events to watch and to follow and fantasy stuff and all that kind of stuff. And look, you know, we get all excited about that stuff. And we think we have a sense that uh, we're going to know who's going to win some of those games. When you have that sense, there's no better place to try your luck, shall we say, than by going to our friends, our new friends at MyBookie. Uh, their website's mybookie.ag, and they're probably one of the best, if not the best, online betting sites you're going to find uh, out there. And, and well-timed, shall we say, right, for the uh, the college and pro football seasons uh, that are upon us. And, uh, of course, we have an incentive for you to give them a try. And that's uh, the promo code SEATS. Use that promo code SEATS at mybookie.ag, and they're going to match your initial deposit dollar for dollar all the way up to 1000 bucks. Yep, that basically means they're going to double... Uh, the amounts you put in up to a thousand dollars by using that promo code seats and that's my bookie mybookie.ag that's the specific url to go to and uh again you can choose from uh, it's not just football right obviously football is a big time uh, uh event for uh for your, your betting purposes but uh, there's just about any sport under the sun uh, that my bookie supports that's uh teams and leagues on the domestic front uh, internationally uh you can bet on fantasy uh, uh points and spreads uh, you can even bet in game during the process of uh, of the actual match. Uh, it's all there for you at mybookie, mybookie.ag. And again, use that promo code seats, and they're going to match your initial deposit dollar for dollar, all the way up to a thousand bucks. Give them a try, mybookie. That's mybookie.ag. We thank them for their support of the show, and uh, we wish you the best of luck, of course, in all your betting endeavors, uh, and wish us luck as we continue our conversation right now. So how does the uh, all right? So the construction seems like it went quite well, despite Hoff uh daily uh, uh, tweaks, I guess, of uh, and being on on site a lot. Um, but so okay, so maybe maybe a little bit of the Colt forty five name change into the Astro into the Astros, which seems logical uh, in hindsight. Yeah. But I'm surprised that that might have not already been in process. Uh, maybe when they even received the team in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the the one thing that. Hoffheitz was Hoffheitz. I know wanted to change that name reasonably quick, and Bob Smith, who was his partner, and pro- had more of the money, but did less of the day-to-day work. Um, was you know, I think agreed with Hoffheitz that a name change was probably a smart idea, and he they both I think liked the thought of something that was more forward looking more modern. Um, the two names that they looked at were the Astros and the stars um, and in fact they they were pretty much in a log jam and could have gone either way um, and you know they they ended up just just going with the astros and um, you know I know. You know, one of Roy's sons said, you know, they that they they really could have just as easily gone with the stars that it was a pretty much a toss up, and that his you know his dad told him that. So, you know, it seems as though they went with the Astros because of the space connection and how much. Like you think about the '60s, the '60s culturally was captivated by the space program, and you think about how 
you know, how big that space program was. And, you know, um, if, if you, you know, reimagine, you know, Kennedy talking about putting a man on the moon and then by the end of the decade, um, you know, that actually happening. And, you know, ironically, it was, you know, it was also the year that, you know, the Mets had won the World Series. The, you know, the, the other team that was an expansion team in the National League the same year that, you know, that the Mets, that the uh, Astros, you know, the Colt 45s went into the league. So you kind of had that. But the other thing about the name that was kind of interesting is the, uh, Colt, the Colt 45 handgun, the revolver, was property of the Colt Firearm Company, you know, a Connecticut-based uh, firearms company. They had pretty much, you know, they hadn't really pushed them for, you know, royalties or naming, you know, a, a cut of a slice of the, uh, you know, I guess, you know, I don't know what you would call them. Yeah, trademark. But, you know, or, yeah, yeah you, you know, just just to get a slice of, of that revenue. Uh, and, you know, the, the, what happened is, the Colt Firearm Company was starting to get antsy and had started to ramp up their attorneys to try to get a cut of that revenue for the naming rights that was predicated on their name. Uh, and as you know, it you know the you know the show Gunsmoke was the number one show in television for much of that decade. So the Colt Forty Five name had a had a good ring to it. But if Hoffheis was going to have to give up money to retain it. He was glad to get rid of it, and in fact, he wanted something more modern anyway. So as soon as as soon as the the, the attorneys from the Colt Firearm Company started talking to you know talking to him about wanting to get a piece of that you know that revenue, he changed the name. And in fact, not only did he change the name, but he got rid of you know pretty much all of the Colt Forty Five memorabilia that was on site. So that's that, what's interesting is that probably makes it a little bit more coveted because there's not tons of it around. It's you know the stuff that was around were things that the fans had from that era. Well, and and now we have the the benefit of hindsight, right? But you look at yeah, you, know, you look at it through through uh, the the prism of the of the past, and and it, it almost feels like a a stroke of genius, right? Uh, the, the the Astro name and 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 the the turf. We'll talk about that in a minute and all that kind of stuff. Um, sure. Well, so take us through what 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 we learned in the the, the lead up and the opening of this uh, of this uh, amazing facility, April 9th, nineteen sixty five. Um, do I have this right that the, that actually, despite all of the grandiosity and the never been done before ness of this, and uh, Roy Hofheinz's uh, uh, diligence, shall we say, in, the, in in its construction, it actually got completed ahead of schedule. Yeah, a little bit. I, you know, there were there were, but there were also some strange things about it that you know uh, made it a little bit weird. You know, on opening day. So, as an example, you know, the parking lights were not were not yet. You know, like it, it may have gotten a bit ahead of schedule. You know, not by much, but the parking lights were not the parking lot. So, you know, getting to your car was, was a little bit tough at night. Uh, you know, I mean, how many people would remember to bring a flashlight and, you know, you were, you know, you go back to the sixties and honestly, you didn't have pocket flashlights back then, you know? So, uh, that was kind of an interesting thing, but, um, you know, I guess the lead up was, there was so much pre-publicity and, you know, the, the community was just so, you know, amazed by, you know, what it was going to mean to the community and how this was going to sort of change Houston forever. And Hoffites, you know, knowing that, you know, not, not only Houston might be captivated, but he wanted a bigger audience. So, you know, he invited, as an example, the president of the United States. Um, and, you know, when they opened it, he was there. Uh, and, you know, he also had, uh, and this is sort of, you know, this helped validate the Astros name, but he invited, you know, the, you know, the, 
all of the astronauts of that era, I believe 23 of them showed up, you know, and they threw out first pitches. I mean, you know, it was sort of a weird thing where it was on, a, on the side, not over home plate, you know, and they were all just throwing to, you know, someone. But, you know, they, they kind of had... Yeah, you know, they made it a big ceremony, and it did get it did get pretty widespread national coverage. I, I mean, I went to sports p- pages from everything from you know smaller rural newspapers to the New York Times to everything else, and the coverage was pretty significant. You know, so it was something that you know it, it was it was perceived as a game changer back then. I mean, it was conceived, it was looked at as something that was going to change the face of baseball. But back then, the one thing about it is they actually had natural grass in there. So that was, you know, it didn't seem like it was as revolutionary maybe as, as it later became. Well, let's, let's, but, let's talk about that for a second. Cause that's a huge part of the, of the story, right? So it seems like that wasn't th- that issue. And maybe you can explain it a little bit more detail wasn't anticipated or maybe it was or and it didn't sort of pan out the way it was was anticipated well what's the story behind that and then obviously the the turf the astro turf trademark sure that, that yeah, it, out of it. It, it's a pretty fascinating story the way it sort of evolved some people think half pints didn't care if the grass issue worked out but they they had they had uh you know, they had some folks in the agriculture department at Texas A and M develop uh, a, a, a strain of a strain of grass called Tifway. I think it was Tifway 453 that would that would grow under low light, uh, you know, settings that didn't need a lot of light, but it would grow under those conditions. Now the problem was, you know, the the lucite panels you could see through. So the sun could come through. So there was enough light for the grass to grow. However, when you would hit a fly ball, and they, you know, they they figure out, you know, engineering wise, you know, how you know it was tall enough not to for fly balls not to hit the ceiling very often. I mean, you know, you have Mike Schmidt accepted. You know, uh, I know he hit a, launched a launched one that you know bounced off one of the speakers. That probably would have been a home run, but just fell, you know, fell straight to, down to the earth and became a ground rule double. But uh, you know, you'd lose fly balls because I guess the sun refracted and changed directions as you, you know, as you looked for the fly ball. It, you lost it entirely. So, I mean, there were folks in the outfield wearing batting helmets because they were scared for their lives. And Hoffheitz was Hoffheitz was very, uh, you know, was very worried about the whole, you know, making this thing work, and ended up, you know, ended up, uh, you know, sort of telling, uh, you know. Tal Smith, you know, who was sort of a special assistant for the Astros at the time, um, you know, that, that, you know, they got to resolve, they got to resolve this issue. And he, he had the panels painted in Lucite, uh, you know, he had the panels painted with just flat white paint, which got rid of the problem of glare and allowed people to feel fly balls, but kill the grass. The grass just couldn't grow, so you had this brown stuff all over the place. And you know, the the result was they had to figure out what do we put down next. And you know, Hoffheinz, um, you know, essentially wanted it solved. And you know, it, it's interesting, but uh, you know, he. He ended up just telling Tal Smith, I don't care what you do, you've got an unlimited budget, solve this problem. And Tal Smith went out to uh, a, a school in Rhode Island, it was the Moses Brown School, and they, they had a field that they used for their sports that was made of artificial turf, uh, and you know, they just sort of, you know, he looked it over. You know, talked to the folks at Chemstrand, which was a division of Monsanto, and they they in essence, you know, figured that's the direction we have to go in. And you know, initially it was just the infield, then it was the entire field, uh, 
but they ended up going to AstroTurf, and that changed the game. I mean, I don't, know, I don't know if you recall, but you know, you had to adjust to the, the strange hops. You also had to adjust to the quickness of the ball off the turf. Um, you also, you know, instead of having the full grass infield, you know, they had the cutouts because that seemed to you know work a little bit better. So you had you had a changing dynamic. Yeah, it's, you know, some of the teams adjusted the speed once the artificial turf went down, and you know that kind of changed the game in a lot of different ways. But the astroturf thing, you know, kind of came about in, in you know in this you know, to resolve the problem of not being able to see and catch fly balls, they kill the grass. Once they kill the grass, they have to come up with a new uh, a new product. Uh, and Hoffheinz basically, you know, I think wanted the artificial turf, you know, wants to present itself as an option because it, feel, it felt more modern. It felt like something that was space-aged. And from his vantage point, anything that seemed like it was the next, generation of product he wanted to be behind that's interesting and again that almost seems like uh, backhandedly uh, a, a bit of genius if you will if if, if, if <laughs> arguably uh, a torturous way to sort of get there i it seems like the 65 season in particular right this sort of yeah. experimentation with grass and even painted dirt i guess what would it seem yeah like they that? they would just get the green paint they would just paint the dirt green so on television it didn't look awful but it was awful <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine the players, and also, I've, frankly, I can't even imagine. I'm just wondering, and I'm, I'm sure I don't know if you have any background on this, but in your research, but I, I'm wondering what league officials were thinking in these first few years of this franchise. Right? You go from obviously the temporary stadium, you got the vision, you got this 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 thing building, but you know, the the first the first three years in in, in Colt Stadium, you know, not so great. You got some weather issues. Uh, the first year of the Astrodome, I mean, you know, in all its uh, grandiosity. Thinking of something somewhat basic like the grass and the playing surface, I, I you wonder what the Major League Baseball people were thinking that, you know, did they make a mistake or this is just, this is just natural yeah. speed bumps towards I, the future? I think it was a mixed, I think it was a mixed set of feelings. I think there was a lot of cognitive dissonance going on there that they were sort of thinking, you know, well, you know, it's great that we have Houston, this big market with the oil, oil wealth and the riches of Texas and you know, they were excited about that aspect of it. They were also, I think, excited about, you know, the fact that they built this dome and it was, you know, it was futuristic and it attracted fans from all over the country, which it really did. I mean, people, you know, Hoffheins did $1 tours and, and lots and lots of people just, you know, went through the turnstiles just to see the place. Uh, so it, it, I think they were excited about the fact that baseball you know, had moved had moved into uh, an area that had pretty good wealth, and that you know sort of foreshadowed new technologies. I think they liked that, but I think they probably felt pretty sheepish, particularly the folks who were were real traditionalists. There were probably a lot of people, a lot of folks in baseball. I'm sure were very much of the opinion this was a mistake. You know, we shouldn't we shouldn't. You know, I'm a purist. I don't think they should have anything other than grass. You know, and I think those folks were probably somewhat horrified and felt like, well, you know, is is this new money worth it? You know, so I think, again, there was probably some cognitive dissonance along the way. And they, there was probably some fear that maybe this was the wrong decision. You know, and AstroTurf was so, a somewhat polarizing thing. I think... A lot of people sort of liked it because in that age, you know, in the 60s, I think people really wanted to embrace new technologies and really thought of anything new as potentially better and gave sort of the gave the benefit of the doubt to improvement versus I think today we're a little more, you know, we're a little bit more, uh, you know, I guess, you know, jaundiced about new technology and we're like, is this really an improvement or is this just a revenue generator? You know, we ask those questions today, whereas I don't think that was that was the case back in the 60s. So there was sort of a, a different dynamic back then. Yeah, I'm also it's fascinating to me that uh, it wasn't until 73 that uh, the uh, the Astros didn't even install the, f the full fledged uh, AstroTurf across the entire field. I mean, it was a combination yeah. of, of dirt and, <laughs> and, and painted. Uh, I, 
I, I, and again, you look back on it. I, I'm sure it made sense at the time, but uh, it seems uh, it seems I, and I and I can see the purists uh, sort of not, uh, uh, you know, understanding or, or being uh, as a, as accommodating, but obviously it became a template for lots of things. Right. Uh, the multipurpose stadia and uh, and all that stuff. Well, let me. So beyond the Astros. Right. Which um, obviously is is elemental, I guess, to the story. Uh, there's other stuff too, right? Because it's not just baseball. It now becomes sort of this uh, uh, arena that uh, can attract other things, such as, for example, uh, maybe more of an asterisk, but uh, not not for our little show. Uh, the actual Houston Stars actually did become a team in the North American Soccer League and the United Soccer Association the year before. Uh, Short lived, but uh, it did. Plus football, right? Maybe I guess the Houston Oilers, maybe maybe you can give us a sense of some of the other events and the other things that this baseball centric uh, structure then made obvious sense for uh, in its in the years to follow. Sure. You know, I think the Houston Stars, I mean, it's interesting, but the Stars actually had very good attendance. I mean, they were, you know, they, they drew almost 20,000 people, you know, which was, was tops for, you know, U.S. soccer back then. And, you know, I, I know the league that followed, the, you know, had the Houston Hurricane, which didn't do nearly as well, really only would draw, you know, close to uh, somewhere in the range of 6,000 a year. Uh, so they struggled. But, you know, I have to wonder if the Stars, you know, and their their success in terms of drawing fans might have might have sort of helped soccer in the United States. I don't know if you remember when the New York Cosmos, uh, you know, had, had, had Pele, who was well over the hill and, you know, wasn't, was a shell of his former self, but was considered the greatest soccer player of all, of all time. So, you know, he played with Franz Beckenbauer in the New York metropolitan area. And I have to wonder if maybe the, and I don't know the answer to this, if, if you know, Houston's ability to draw close to 20,000 might have given rise to, well, let's give this a shot, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, might have made soccer a, a bigger thing, uh, you know, at the time. Because, I mean, that, that was probably, you know, soccer's biggest chunk of publicity, the Cosmos, uh, at least on a national level, until you know the more recent days, you know where I think, you know most I think most most communities have youth soccer and it's it's pretty ubiquitous now. It wasn't back then, but I you know some of the other events. I mean, I think it's, I think, you know, Hoffheinz looked at it as this all-purpose place. He had Billy Graham in with his crusade for Christ. He had, you know, uh, boat shows in, and, you know, he had he had some wild things. He, you know, he had, I think for three years, they had midget auto racing, you know, these little small Formula One-type cars. And he had A.J. Foyt in, and I remember one year, Sports Illustrated did an article about it, and, and one of the years, I guess, you know, for he got you know bumped and you know run into one of the the corners with this one of these midget cars and had a Philly knocked out in a race. So there was a, there were some really weird and interesting events. You also had the Battle of the Sexes, which was a major major event. You know in terms of you know gender. You know and you know if you're a gender studies uh, scholar. That's a that's an event that took place in the Astrodome that that was huge. It was larger than life. It was broadcast nationally. You know, Bobby Riggs against Billie Jean King was just this massive event that, you know, today. I mean, it, what was it three or four years ago? They did a movie on it. You know, and you know it's, that's how big it is. They're still talking about it. But you also had. You know the precursor to March Madness, the the game of the century. You know the the John Wooden's uh, UCLA Bruins. You know with Lou Alcindor. You know Kareem Abdul-Jabbar now. Um, you know playing against uh, the Houston Cougars, and it was the number one team in the country, uh, UCLA, versus the number two team in the country. You know with Guy Lewis uh, and Elvin Hayes, and I mean that was. That was such a big game. A lot of uh, it was it was put on syndication television and drew a major audience. And a lot of a lot of network affiliates preempted the regularly scheduled program to air that. It was actually uh, one of Dick Enberg's coming out parties. He 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 broadcast the game with Bob Pettit, and. It, it did so much to show that ba- basketball, college basketball, could be a big thing. 
that I think it gave it it gave the NCAA the real feeling that you know something like March Madness could take root, and I think it was the it, it essentially I think helped put college basketball on the map as a major commercial product. Yeah, no, no doubt. We we had uh, on uh, our twenty sixth episode uh, uh, the uh, producer and director of that Howard Zuckerman. He was uh, giving us some. Uh, some real great uh, stories behind the scenes with TVS, uh, the, uh, the television network, and and all those stories. And but uh, you know that also leads me into and TVS is maybe the 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 the, uh, the pivot here into uh, yeah. backhandedly into football, right? Because football, obviously, big in Texas, just generally, of course, we all know, and has historically been so. But but football, very much uh, a uh, a huge part of the history of this uh, of this structure. Obviously, starting with the Oilers, maybe you can sort of give us a. A sense of that, but also any other pro football thing that sort of came along after the fact, whether it be the WFL for a cup of coffee or the USFL with the Houston Gamblers, football and uh, the Astrodome were that was that with all due respect, once this thing was built was the uh, destination for for that even on the college level, too. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And you even had the, the, you know, what used to be called the Blue Bonnet Bowl changed to the Astro Blue Bonnet Bowl. I and never that was, understood that one. As a kid growing up and seeing that on <laughs> PBS or Ms. Lou, right? Uh, yeah. It, talk about a, a, a mashup that didn't make any sense, but. No, it didn't. But you know what? It, it, it was kind of a Texas product. I know, I, I know as an example, there were 18, for 18 years it was in the Astrodome. And I, you know, there was a general tendency to get a Texas team in in the mix. I know for the, you know the eighteen you know for those eighteen ga- games, uh, you know the, I think thirteen of them had Texas teams, you know involved in the competition. So you know I I think you know even though it was something that you could see nationally, and you're right, I think Mislu did a lot of those games, but uh, you know I I think. It was it was kind of a Texas centric event to some degree, and that they wanted to put on a a bowl game for Texas, and they wanted to make sure that a Texas team more often than not was represented. And you know, some of the games where they didn't have a Texas team, you know, they had some pretty major teams as well. You know, like uh, you know, nineteen seventy was Alabama and Oklahoma. You know, and, and they 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 had you know Stanford and Georgia in seventy eight and. You know Michigan and UCLA. You know in in eighty one. So you know they did they did attract some. You know it's, they did attract major teams, but they also you know always had a, a major Texas team involved as well to the degree that they could. It's that's totally interesting, and I, I the whole college bowl thing. I, I that may be a whole another separate podcast because and the names and the, 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 the how they come and go and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the Astro Blue Bonnet Ball again. Growing up myself in the New York metropolitan area, I also as a Cosmos yeah. fan. And by the way, very just fascinated by sort of what is this, what is this hyphenated thing, and and uh, and, and why am I watching it, uh, and and being fascinated by it. Um, but on, on the on the Oilers front, right? Because you know, I, I'm really curious about this because you know the Oilers obviously, and we've talked about this in a couple of other episodes. You know, part of the AFL and the big challenger to the yeah. uh, the NFL construct, the Lamar Hunt, blah blah blah. But um, so I, th- obviously they became uh, the ch- one of the charter franchises in uh, 1960, and they played at Jefferson Stadium for about four yeah. years, and then at Rice Stadium for two years or three seasons after that. Uh, but they didn't come into the Astrodome until 1968. I'm just I'm really curious, and uh, maybe you have some of this this knowledge or history about this w- w- in relation to the uh, to the Astrodome or not. I'm I'm just really curious as yeah. to why it took relatively so long since the building was open in '65. Well, I, I'll say. Yeah. I can pretty much give you some of the background of that, and so, you know, some of it you probably would have to dig pretty deep to get at it. But I think there was there was an animosity between Roy Hoffheitz and and Bud Adams, the owner of the Oilers, and you know, I, I just remember, you know, Adams always always felt as though you know he he brought a product to the to the table that should have been recognized as a product that, you know, that, uh, you know, was good for Houston. And in his mind, Houston, he should have been given a better deal in the Astrodome. You know, and in fact, when he was negotiating with Hoffheitz, one of the things he tried to do is he tried to, he tried to 
give the perception that, that Hoffheinz was was trying to overcharge him in a very significant way for rent, and that's why he wasn't going to move into the Astrodome. And one of the things he said is, and I thought this was kind of a funny quote, if you think the Astrodome's the eighth wonder of the world, uh, Roy Hoffheinz, you know, the contract Roy Hoffheinz has drawn up for, for me is the ninth. You know? <laughs> and he just said, you know, I'm not going to move to a place where I have to overpay and he held out until until they actually came to a, an agreement with what was fair. And I think Adams, you know, Adams was always, he was an interesting figure in that he was sort of a high-flying oil guy who would, you know, was more, was sort of, made a little bit more noise than a quiet Lamar Hunt was relatively quiet and very buttoned down and you know I think Bud Adams was a little bit more boisterous and wanted to be seen as sort of you know one of these wild unpredictable Texas guys who would sign free agents and and in his early years he put together some pretty darn good teams I mean you know they were in the AFC championships games you know and were AFC champions but those first two years were very successful for the Oilers uh, in Jefferson Stadium Uh, although I will say that stadium was you know was not not the best stadium, and, and I mean the field was pretty muddy quite a bit. There was sort of a story, and I, I I don't recall who it was, but one of the offensive linemen, his shoe had fallen off in the mud. They never recovered it because it was so, such a mud pit they couldn't find the shoe. So I mean that gives you a sense of you know how bad the field was, but it also gives you a sense of the extreme that Bud Adams would go to to not cave to. Uh, you know, to, uh, you know, Roy Hoffheitz and, you know, how committed he was to trying to get a deal that he felt was fair. Uh, you know, so, so it, but it's interesting. I mean, the Oilers, once they moved into the Astrodome, honestly, they had some, they had some wonderfully, you know, interesting teams. I remember, you know, when they had Pastorini with Earl Campbell, those were some, those were some really good teams. And, you know, to their misfortune, they were going up against the Raiders and the Steelers all the time. And those two teams, you know, pretty much prevented them from getting to the Super Bowl. But I just remember some of the hardest hitting games being those games against either either the, the Oilers and the Steelers or the Raiders. They, I mean, they were some of the most brutal football games I'd ever seen. Oh, sure. And it was a huge, huge passion. And then Houston really sort of embraced them as, as the years went on. Well, I, so it also, though, gives me some uh, inkling that uh, that the, it's really, you know, Hoffheinz had leverage, right, over Adams, right? And and, and maybe as we sort of uh, begin to round the corner here on our, our chat, it's been a pretty interesting. And, I, you know, I've only been to Houston a handful of times and I've seen only seen the Astrodome just driving by it. But this is, this is really interesting. This is really interesting stuff. Um, what is this Houston Sports Association thing? Because it, it feels to me like this is sort of the the, the device by which Hoffheinz kind of uh, 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 I don't know exerted his uh, his leverage and his power, if you will, over yeah. this 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 uh, structure and, and and sort of overseeing what made what made the great and didn't and and what the future of this uh, this stadium was all about. Yeah, the Houston Sports Authority was sort of the politi- It was sort of the the you know, board of directors of, you know, Houston, of sort of greater Houston sports via the Astrodome. Uh, it was something that was put together, uh, you know, Bob Smith, uh, you know, Kirksey, uh, Hoffheinz, and a lot of the big money were all part of this Houston Sports Authority. So it was it was filled with pretty powerful folks, but Hoffheinz was pretty much the controller of that, and and you know could sort of use it, you know, use it, you know, to his advantage. Uh, and you know, if, if something, you know, if if. You know, Hoffheitz wanted to do something. The Houston Sports Authority was sort of, you know, that sort of political vehicle he could use to get it done. Uh, but, uh, you know, I know Kirksey kind of, it initially got put together. What happened is uh, it was put together prior to getting the baseball team. They they sort of put it together, and then it wound up sort of being the leverage. The Houston Sports Association, it, it, it's 
sort of a complex thing, but what happened is you had a triple A team that was that was you know run by Marty Marion, and in essence, they were independent of the HSA, but it was you know essentially they. Marion's organization had an affiliation with baseball and the Houston Sports Association was sort of used as sort of the vehicle to get Major League Baseball to back Houston. You know, there was a fear. Yes, there were some folks in Houston who feared that Marion would, because he was somewhat respected by, you know, the Major League folks, that he would use his leverage and somehow jump ahead of, you know, the folks who wanted the Astrodome built. So, you know, the HSA had to make it abundantly clear that nothing was going to happen, in, you know, as far as the Astrodome, unless the, you know, unless uh, the HSA was recognized rather than the, uh, you know, rather than the, uh, you know, the folks that were with the uh, Houston Buffs, which was the trip, it was, which was the minor league team at the time. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's sort of, you know, how the Houston Sports Association kind of rose and evolved. All right, I got two last questions for you then, um, and and it, 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 we're, we'll absolutely come back to this uh, uh, this discussion, this topic, because uh, this, this is just a whole thing, a whole bunch of things to unpack. Some some wacky stories, I'm sure, still, um, but um, maybe you can kind of give us the sort of Cliff Notes version of sort of the uh, the decline. I think some of this is obvious stuff and economics and and modern uh shakedown i guess of communities and all that kind of stuff but uh the astrodome still stands uh, and i maybe give us a sort of sense of what might come uh what happens with this structure going forward but maybe sort of a little bit of like how the how the astrodome sort of ceased to be uh shall we say it's a modern uh, day yeah i i think what happened with the astrodome is in essence, technology caught up with uh, with the Astrodome. To keep these facilities fully and thoroughly modern, you really you really have to you know keep investing money and more money and more money. And what what was tough about it is because it was a circular structure, because it was you know concrete, you could you could maybe build a some more seats into it, which which they actually did, uh, you know, and they did expand the size, the 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 number of spectators who could come in there, you know, by getting rid of that legendary scoreboard, which is probably you know a conversation in and of itself. But uh, you know, they they got more seats into the Astrodome, but the Astrodome, you know, was limited in its size. So if you wanted to be a if you were a football owner and you wanted to get 70,000 into a facility, you, you had to get rid of the Astrodome. Now, it, it, on the baseball side, it wasn't it, it was okay for baseball, but it wasn't ideal for baseball in that it, because it was a concrete donut, uh, you know, there were some seats that were pushed, you know, further back that weren't the greatest for, for baseball. So, you know, that once the retro era hit, it was pretty obvious, you know, as Camden Yards got built and people started looking at these more intimate, uh, old-fashioned, but with all the amenities of new, uh, people started looking and saying, you know, this is this is an old venue. We got to get we've got to get rid of it. And Americans love modernity. They like to have the latest and greatest. I mean, you think about, you know, one of the reasons, you know, and you can you can debate a lot of reasons why America is, is you know, is as great as it is. But I think one of the reasons is because we do embrace modernity to the degree that we do. We're always looking for new things. We're always looking for innovation, and we do so pretty relentlessly. And I think the Astrodome just got to be a little bit old. Uh, you know, I mean, as digital technology evolved, that huge scoreboard looked, you know, looked a little, you know, it wasn't Technicolor. It, you know, it didn't have, you know, the pixels that these, these new, you know, Diamond Vision boards had and, you know, some of the, you know, some of the amazing digital scoreboards today have. So, you know, it just, it just got to be old. Uh, but what's happened with the Astrodome more recently, because I think you want me to get back to that, is, you know, it, it will be an all-purpose facility with parking as part of the, the mix. So it's going to be a parking lot slash all-purpose facility. So it's never going to be the kind of venue it was in its, you know, in its grand heyday. But what it will be is 
is sort of a, a nice, uh, you know, sort of accompanying structure to, you know, NRG Field, the place where the Houston Texans play. And what I think will happen with it, it's going to be interesting to see, but I think it's, it's going to make Houston more, uh, more likely to get major events because you have a place right next to it with a lot of square footage for and it's with you know within very close walking distance of the uh, you know of the newer more modern stadium where you can have you know pregame parties you know evening before parties uh you know sort of social events and gatherings like you think about with March Madness you could throw a pretty decent party right next door to the you know the large stadium and a smaller venue you know, with parking all right there and everything somewhat easy and convenient. I think that's somewhat of a selling point for the city of Houston. Uh, and, you know, there's a, a Judge Ed Emmett who, who quite frankly, pushed very hard to preserve the Astrodome. And a lot of people thought, you know, he he was making a mistake. And a lot of people, you know, talked about the Astrodome being Emmett's folly. But I, I think if they do it right, and I, you know, I have a sense that they will. Uh, they have an engineering firm, uh, Kirksey Architecture, that actually, you know, is is you know, related to the original George Kirksey, who's actually working on it with, uh, you know, with with you know the same architect that built the Astrodome, um, and and that honestly should. Uh, you know that that honestly, I think will will be something that's awful nice when it's done, but it's never going to be exactly what it, what it was. You know the original, uh, you know the original engineers for the Astrodome were, was Walter P. Moore, and that's where uh, you know Ken Womack, my uh, colleague, uh, where his grandfather, uh, you know, sort of did all the pioneering work on the Astrodome. Well, it's interesting because it, 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 my understanding is that uh, there was a real and almost very close. Uh, uh, discussion about uh, bringing it down, right? And only recently yeah, it, has it been saved. It, they they really did. I think there. Were, I think that there were a number of people who just wanted to knock it down. And and you know, Ken Hoffman, one of the more popular Houston columnists, was one of those voices. You know, he he said he you know liked the Astrodome. Uh, you know, for its innovative, you know, and cutting edge. You know what it did for Houston in, in those terms, but he just thought its day had passed and it's time to bring it down. Uh, you know, and and there were a lot of people, you know, who were pretty vocal voices for bringing it down. And that's usually what happens with these ballparks. We wind up knocking them down. And uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, when you look at America, you know, I have to wonder if the Sistine Chapel would still be there if Michelangelo was an American citizen, because, you know, we like to, you know, just build new. Uh, and, you know, preservation is not as big a priority in the United States as it is in, you know, some European countries is, is an example. Sadly. Sadly, for sure. All right, here's my last question. Uh, you, we did mention this, and um, there's some great imagery and stuff uh, on the web uh, on this stuff. Uh, you did mention this scoreboard, and, and maybe just in uh, uh, just in general, maybe describe sort of how innovative that part of the astronome experience was uh, in uh, in you know in the '60s and '70s, '80s too. Yeah, it was an amazing amazing scoreboard. No one had ever envisioned something like this. It was. It was the length of three football fields, if you, because it just circled around the entire, you know, the entire Astrodome. So it was, it was a massive thing, and you know, it it, it took so many lights, and you needed. I think it was initially, I think it was five engineers to make it function, and they had all these different, you know, entertainment things, and they could run commercials between innings, and they could do all kinds of things. Uh, you know, play songs. Uh, you know, I just remember it was such a fascinating thing that in the late 60s, sports, there was a full blown Sports Illustrated article on just the scoreboard. So if you think about, you know, you think about how, you know, Sports Illustrated tries to focus on people and the people who make sports what it is. 
but it was so enamored by you know the uniqueness of the scoreboard that it had to you know it, it had to write an article about it. So I mean, to me that that's fascinating that it got that. But you know, when the Oilers threatened to leave, it got dismantled, and they put seating where the scoreboard was just to expand to try to keep Bud Adams happy. Unfortunately, less than five years later, he was out of there anyway. So you know, the scoreboard went. But the scoreboard, you know, it's it was old technology, and you know, if you had it today. I don't think you would be as amazed by it, but back in the '60s, it was it was just fascinating and amazing. And Hoffheitz thought, you know, we need to make this first rate, and he did recoup some revenues from it, you know, with commercials and things like that between innings. But at the same time, I think fans came and they just loved that scoreboard uh, until it got to be sufficiently old that you know it. It, you know, it didn't matter quite as much. Yeah, and we'll, we'll have some uh, some imagery when we uh, post this episode uh, on that. The, on great. This. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's it's cool. It's multicolored, and uh, the home run bowl, and and the 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 uh, the, the shooting uh, cowboy guy, and so some really really bowls, really cool. Really, and all that stuff. Yeah, really yeah. really cool stuff. And and I think it's also this also sort of puts a point on it, right? This is. Um, you know, this is a structure that uh, changed the game, literally and figuratively, in many different ways, uh, yeah. in terms of conveniences, in terms of uh, uh, excitement in the stadium, the entertainment value, uh, clearly uh, uh, things like comfort uh, against elements, and and frankly, from a civic pride and uh, and economic modeling perspective, right? So that's why I think that, you know, it's kind of why we do some of these uh, these interviews and these stories and stuff, but it's also, you know, and, and it, it's loosely connected, of course, to uh, a bunch of teams that are, are no longer with us. Obviously, the Astros continue to do very well, obviously, and in, in, even, yeah. even this year's uh, uh, baseball playoffs, but, uh, but, you know, some of the teams that uh, came and went with the facility. Uh, and that's why uh, this has been a, a, a fascinating journey for me. Obviously, not being a Houston uh, uh, native, I'm sure there are plenty of people who are listening in the Houston or the Texas generally area that are yelling at their devices for uh, all kinds of stories and, and things, or maybe even corrections. I don't even know. Uh, but uh, this is this has been great. I, I appreciate. It. Do you? So uh, I guess sort of we'll round it up. But are there any other? Um, uh, here's some promotional opportunity. Why don't you just tell us about, uh, give us the name of the book, where you can find it, and maybe do you have any other things coming up uh, in and okay. around this realm, too, uh, that you have envisioned? Yeah, you know, the book's called The Eighth Wonder of the World, The Life of Houston's Iconic Astrodome, and it basically tries to get at, you know, all of the nuances and, and culture of the Astrodome and how it got built and who the the personalities were. And what's interesting is it's it's done very well. It's won, you know, it's won numerous awards. One of the awards that I'm very proud of is, you know, the Sabre, Society for American Baseball Research, gave it the Seymour Medal, which is the award that they give for the top history book. So, you know, it's it's something that we, Ken and I really worked very hard to, you know, make sure that we got it as accurate as we could, as historically sharp as we could. And the paperback version actually is is due to be released November 1st. So, so that's on the horizon, you know, at the end of this month. Uh, and Nebraska, it's University of Nebraska Press. They're very good. Uh, at getting it hitting their deadline, so my hunch is it'll probably be out in the last week of October. But I, I you know, November first is when they've promised publishers, you know, and they, you know, their vendors that it would be out and available. So that's kind of a nice thing. And it, it, what's great about it is there are so many people who have helped us with this project. I know. Um, you know, we taught, we we went to Houston various times. We spent a lot of time in the Houston Public Library, the University of Houston Library. Um, you know, we we went to, uh, you know, we went to uh, you know the uh, you know the architects Walter P. Moore, and actually they gave us so much information, and fa- and they gave us access to some of the original things that that helped us to describe what was going on in the Astrodome. They they had the blueprints, which are like the size, they're actually probably about either the size of or slightly larger than an average desk, but it's like this big fat, you know, layer of canvas prints that are all different colors that you flip so that you can see the, you know, the electrical, you can see, you know, all of the different, um, 
you know, the plumbing, you can see every nuance of the design. And uh, I just remember uh, Narendra Gosain, you know, who's who since retired from uh, Walter P. Moore, gave us you know, an entire day, and we went through the Astrodome facility itself. He got us in there uh, when no one else in the public could go in there. Um, and, you know, he also showed us, you know, all those things. And we, we were able to spend, you know, an entire day just going through stuff. And then the next morning, he kept the room, you know, the room that he put everything in open for us to spend, you know, even more time just trying to gather and get stuff and, and you know, sort of figure things out. So, I mean, we were, you know, Ken Womack and I put the book together, but we had so many great people. I know Jim Nance, you know, enjoyed the book and, and um, you know, the CBS, uh, you know, CBS play-by-play uh, man. Uh, and uh, interestingly, I worked with him when when I was leaving CBS. He was just starting at CBS. But he and I kind of have a history together because I worked with him, uh, you know, when we were doing Sports Central USA, and he was a college student feeding stories um, for Sports Central USA, <laughs> believe it or not. So what's what's fun is we've got to talk to so many good people about um, you know, used in its history and the unique, uniqueness of the dome. And, you know, my hope is people just enjoy what we're doing. I mean, I, I honestly um, am not worried about selling books, but what I would like to do is if people, you know, are interested in the book, if, if they don't want to buy it, get your local library to buy it. Because the bottom line is, you know, if, if a lot of people have access to it, I think they'll learn a lot about the Astrodome and that could be a very good thing. All right, our thanks to uh, Bob Trumper for the uh, the conversation about uh, the Houston uh, Astrodome, uh, a fascinating structure, a fascinating story, and uh, one that uh, will uh, certainly unearth a, a few more uh, tidbits of interest that uh, we will likely pursue, not only uh, uh, the Astrodome itself, but uh, the various teams, et cetera, uh, that were part of it. And uh, it's great to see that the, uh, the Astrodome will live on in some way, shape, or form, and uh, historically preserved at that. And uh, the book, of course, is called The Eighth Wonder of the World, The Life of Houston's Iconic Astrodome. Uh, It is written by Bob and uh, his co-author, Ken uh, Womack. Uh, There's a forward in there by uh, Mickey Herskowitz. And uh, it is uh, published by our friends at the University of Nebraska Press. And the uh, newly issued uh, paperback version of it will be out uh, around when this episode drops. So if this is, I think this is the beginning of November, uh, you can get that book uh, now. And uh, the best place, of course, Uh, to get a pick up a copy of that book or the Kindle version or whatever uh, is through our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. And uh, there you will find, just search up little uh, episode uh, uh, number 85 with Bob uh, and me, and you will uh, see all kinds of interesting uh, imagery as well as all the links you'll need, uh, including one that will lead you to uh, Amazon to purchase the book. Uh, And we appreciate your doing so. We get a couple of shekels for that, and uh, it's a great way to support the show. And uh, we also want to remind you, or at least tell you, that uh, the clip that we used at the beginning of the show uh, is also something that uh, we highly encourage you to check out. It is a movie called The Eighth Wonder of the World. Uh, That was the promo for it. And it aired, I think, a couple of times on the MLB network uh, back in, uh, I think, late 2015, maybe early 2016. Uh, It is produced by uh, an entity out of, uh, uh, I think, Austin, Texas, called Texas Crew Productions. And uh, maybe with any luck, we'll uh, get to talk to some of the folks who put that documentary together. I, I, I'll be damned if I'll be able to find uh, the full version of that uh, if, and if it's out there. But uh, we will certainly dig in and find out where that episode or that movie is. And again, that was called The Eighth Wonder of the World. Uh, and we hope to see uh, that uh, out there at some point. But uh, that's where we got that clip. And uh, make no mistake, there's absolutely a ton of other stories that uh, are worth exploring uh, circa Uh, the Houston Astrodome and Houston in general. And hopefully we'll get to a few of those uh, in the weeks and months to come. And uh, stay tuned for that, shall we say. Uh, And uh, we want to thank you for uh, following us on uh, all of our various digital and uh, social uh, connections. As we said, goodseatsstillavailable.com. That's the website. Check us out there. You want to send us some email, please, by all means, do so. We're at hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. You will find us on uh, various social 
uh, media for us, such as Twitter, of course, at Good Seats Still. You'll find us on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you will also find a page devoted to us on Facebook. And um, I think that's plenty of ways to get in touch with us. So there's no excuse not to there. And uh, of course, and again, as always, we want to thank our friends at uh, Podfly Productions. That's podfly.net. Our friend Jerry Payne, who helps put all our various pieces together each week. And uh, we thank them for all of their, and him, for all of their uh, editing and uh, production services. That's Podfly Productions, Podfly. Dot net. Okay, thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to go rate and review us uh, uh, wherever you find this show. Uh, all of those things help our little algorithm and more people like you to find us. And uh, we certainly appreciate uh, all those stars and thumbs up that you can give us. Uh, and it keeps us going each and every week. And until next week, uh, we hope you have a great one and we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.